Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about an efficient break of super singular isogeny Diffie Hellman. Um, this uh, started with joint work with Thomas de Cruy, then there was concurrent work by Chloe de Chano, who then teamed up with Benjamin uh, Wieselowski, uh, Lawrence Pani, and um, Giacomo Pope. Uh, but I will mainly follow the more recent approach by Damien Robert in this talk, uh, but I'll get back to that uh, uh, when, uh, when, when we are there. So first, let me sketch some context. Um, and I didn't introduce this for cynical reasons. I didn't know the website was going to be hacked. Um, but uh, yeah, just for the sake of context, um, all currently deployed public key cryptography is based on the hardness of two mathematical problems. So one is uh, integer factorization, and so the, like this SIM website is uh, uh, secured by RSA encryption. And the other is uh, elliptic curve cryptography, which is based on the discrete logarithm problem on elliptic curves over finite fields. So those are uh, super widely uh, spread. So this is the thing that is happening now all the time. Uh, but already in 1994, uh, there was a warning by Peter Schor, who uh, described a, a polynomial time algorithm for breaking both uh, computational problems. Um, but you really need a quantum computer to, uh, to, uh, to run the algorithm, okay? And so for a long time, this was uh, considered uh, more like a, a theoretical result without any practical uh, implications. But growingly, there is some, some concern uh, that this uh, quantum computers might become reality. Um, it's already for 15, 20 years maybe that people say that it could happen in the next 15 to 20 years. So it's unclear what the status is or whether this will ever, ever become reality even. Uh, and by a quantum computer here, I mean a universal quantum computer that can run a Shor's algorithm. But there is uh, a consensus that there is a non-negligible non risk that it will happen. Yeah, and this is enough for us to, to take action. Um, so this motivates a rapid transition to post-quantum cryptography. Just to be clear, let me define post-quantum cryptography because there's also something called quantum cryptography and this is uh, something entirely different. Post-quantum cryptography is cryptography that runs on classical computers. So you can deploy it now. And it just, it's a type of cryptography that makes sure we are ready against uh, the quantum computer of the future. Yeah, so it's classical cryptography, but it resists quantum computers. That's post-quantum cryptography. Um, and the two main uh, arguments that are given for this transition is that, uh, well, for instance, the history of elliptic curve cryptography has learned us that from the proposal in the scientific literature to the worldwide deployment, it takes like 25 to 30 years, or at least in the case of elliptic curve cryptography. So we have to yeah, be, be prepared for a long transition phase. Um, and then the second thing is also uh, often mentioned for long-term secrets. Uh, they are harvested now, like by intelligence agen agencies or so, um, uh, and they are just stored. And then uh, when the quantum computer arrives, uh, these uh, long-term secrets uh, can be decrypted. So uh, to protect long-term secrets, we also need to use post-quantum cryptography now. And so the big catalyst for this whole transition phase for the moment is a, is a standardization effort. Uh, so uh, we typically call it a competition uh, organized by NIST. Uh, so that's an American uh, government institute. Um, and they focus on uh, post-quantum algorithms for key encapsulation, so key agreements uh, like Diffie-Hellman and digital signatures. So uh, before we go to isogenies, uh, let me list the five main hard problems that are being considered for use in post-quantum uh, schemes. So four of them are really mathematical problems. The last one is a bit of an outlier. Um, so the main hard problem is not isogenies, it's uh, finding short vectors in lattices. So the, the leading proposals are based on variants of the shortest vector problem in lattices. Then there's a related problem, uh, which is decoding in um, uh, random linear code. So both of them could be uh, described as noisy linear algebra. So they belong a bit to the same family. Um, then there's uh, solving nonlinear systems of equations over finite fields. This is another uh, thing that is being considered. And uh, we are here for, uh, for the isogeny part. So finding isogenies between elliptic curves over finite fields is also hard. And that's uh, also true for uh, uh, in case an adversary has a quantum computer. And the last thing is, uh, is more like a, a generic construction based on hash functions, which can only be used to construct signatures. Um, I won't go into the details of that. Uh, and this is my last context slide. Let me put everything in here at once. We won't go over the whole list, uh, but just pay attention to the, to the logos here. So um, these are like the six standards 
that NIST selected for now. Uh, these are a bit outliers, as I said. They are stateful signatures, less, less uh, generically useful. Uh, and then there are three uh, uh, proposals based on lattices and one again on hash functions. And then there's an extra round of uh, scrutiny uh, that was launched for uh, these three schemes. They are based on uh, codes and also psych, uh, which was based on isogenies, uh, is in there. But uh, this talk is about a break of psych, so this is uh, gone. Um, uh, yeah, and I already mentioned uh, the three works uh, that I will, uh, uh, well, not, I, as I said, I will mainly talk about Robert's work, so this is the last thing. But in any case, I hope that this uh, picture conveys that uh, despite the fact that we are considering five hard problems, it's a bit, uh, uh, yeah, homogenic in the sense that um, all proposals for now, except for the outliers uh, that are based on hash functions, uh, are based on noisy linear algebra. And this is a concern for NIST. So NIST wants to re-diversify the pool somehow, and for this reason they, uh, they launched a new competition. So the submission deadline was last week, and some people are still catching up sleep, uh, with sleep from that <laughs> deadline. Uh, and there are, again, isogeny-based uh, schemes that were uh, submitted. Uh, so ski sign, uh, namely. Okay, so, um, yeah, uh, maybe this is uh, not needed, but uh, just to be all on the same page, uh, let me define the isogeny by finding problem uh, somewhat properly. So an isogeny is a non-constant homomorphism between elliptic curves. Homomorphism both in the sense of, uh, of curves, so a morphism of curves, uh, but you can also think of this as a homomorphism of groups. Uh, they are surjective, they have a finite kernel. Uh, the number of elements in the kernel is, uh, is typically equal to the degree uh, as a morphism. And this is kind of important, so uh, there is a converse to this. So whenever you have a finite subgroup of an elliptic curve, you can kind of quotient out that subgroup. So there exists an isogeny, which, uh, so this is a surjective group homomorphism, which has kernel k. Yeah, so you can really think of, of this uh, codomain E prime as E modulo k. And this is uh, a little bit ambiguous, but not too much, because uh, this codomain E prime is unique up to, up to isomorphism. Yeah. And uh, there exist many um, works in the literature. So in the case of elliptic curves, uh, these are the most famous ones, but uh, also in higher dimension that we'll need later, there are uh, works on this that uh, take as input, so algorithms that take as input an elliptic curve and a finite subgroup, and they uh, spit out the isogeny uh, and, um, and the codomain. Uh, however, the complexity is, uh, is very much dependent on the degree of the isogeny, so that if the degree isogeny is large, this is infeasible. If for instance, if it's a large prime member. Uh, okay, uh, then we'll also be mentioning the notion of a dual isogeny, so this is kind of an inverse if you want, uh, but it's, they are not isomorphisms, so it's not really an inverse, uh, but it's uh, an isogeny such that if you compose it with the original one, you get a scalar multiplication uh, on both elliptic curves. Uh, and this turns being isogenous in an uh, equivalence relation. Okay, so let's uh, now state the isogeny finding problem. I state it in terms, you don't really need this to state the problem, but uh, I think it's nice. Um, so uh, there's this famous theorem by Tate. Uh, well, it's a much more general statement, but for uh, elliptic curves over finite fields, it says that uh, two elliptic curves over a finite field are isogenous over that finite field. So the isogeny should be defined over FQ, if and only if the number of rational points is the same. And then the isogeny problem, you could state it as follows. Uh, you are given two elliptic curves, E and E prime, with the same number of points. I state it like this uh, because in this way it's clear that it's easy to check whether the problem is well defined because we can uh, count points efficiently. Uh, and then the output has to be uh, some isogeny uh, connecting E to E prime. Yeah? So we know it has to exist and the question is uh, find it. And so let me stress again, uh, the best algorithms that we have uh, in general, so there are some special cases that are easier, but the best algorithms we have uh, run in exponential time and uh, quantum computers do not seem to help. Um, and the break of SIDA uh, doesn't change this. So this, uh, these statements remain true to date. Um, now, let's also uh, think a bit about, that, about what it means to return an isogeny. Because for instance, if this is a map of a very large degree, yeah, we won't be able to to describe it just as a rational map, really with, uh, with defining equations. That, that will not work. And until recently, uh, our common understanding of returning an isogeny was that we hope that the isogeny that has to be returned has a smooth degree, 
for instance, a, a power of two or a, or, a, or a product of very small primes. And then we return the isogeny not at once, but as a composition of uh, isogenies of small degree. Yeah. And so until very recently, this was our default understanding of, re of returning an isogeny. But I think that the most important uh, byproduct of, of, uh, of these works is that we now have a new understanding of what it could mean to return an isogeny. Yeah, so uh, you can now also specify an isogeny by giving its degree and by giving how it acts on a basis of the n-torsion for some sufficiently large n. Yeah, and this, uh, it will be a corollary of this work, that this is an efficient representation of an isogeny. Yeah, and this uh, already had some constructive applications, which I think are more important on the long run than the attack. But for now, let's, uh, yeah, let's, so this was, yeah, clarified uh, in, a, in a paper by Robert. I have all these references at the end of the slides. Um, so, but for now, let's forget about this. Yeah, for now, we do not, we do not know this. Um, okay. Then, um, so let me see how I'm doing time-wise. Ah, there's a clock there. Um, so let's uh, have a brief look at super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman from a high level. So there are many technical aspects to it that I will not discuss. But on a high level, uh, the idea is to build kind of a commutative diagram. Um, uh, and this is done jointly by Alice and Bob. So this is an isogeny that is computed by Alice. So what is the idea? Alice uh, picks a secret, so that's why it's colored in red, a secret subgroup A uh, of this elliptic curve E and she quotients out this subgroup A. Yeah, and so, as I said uh, before, this makes sense. So this, is, uh, this results in a new elliptic curve, uh, EA, and she publishes EA. And Bob does the same. He quotients out a secret subgroup B. He uh, arrives at an elliptic curve EB that he publishes. And now the idea, but that's not trivial, uh, how to make this work, so let me uh, plot everything. The idea is now, you can ignore this, uh, this push forward notation, but the idea is now that uh, Bob, continues from Alice's elliptic curve, EA, and computes this isogeny. Um, and the goal of this isogeny is that it quotients out uh, phi A of B. So B is Bob's secret subgroup. Phi A is Alice's secret isogeny. And somehow we would like that Bob is able to uh, get a hand on phi A of B uh, so that he can quotient this out and compute this isogeny. Yeah? And so, uh, so by just group theoretic reasons, if you want, he uh, has then also computed uh, E modulo, the group generated by A and B. Yeah, and then the idea is that Alice does the same. So she quotients out Bob, Bob's public curve EB uh, by phi B of A. A is her secret subgroup, phi B is Bob's secret isogeny, and so uh, she then also arrives at E uh, A plus B. Yeah, and this is then the common uh, secret. That's the idea. But it should be clear that this is not trivial. How do we give Bob uh, access to uh, phi A of B? Uh, Bob knows B, that's not a problem, but Bob definitely knows, doesn't know phi A, and we cannot give him phi A because this would break the whole uh, scheme. And the, sol the solution that um, uh, uh, De Feo and uh, uh, Zhao came up with in 2011 already um, is to uh, let Alice generate her subgroup A from two public points P, A, and Q, A. So you can think of this as a something, some kind of two-dimensional or, or a rank two uh, subgroup of E. Uh, and inside uh, that rank two subgroup, Alice, Alice selects like a secret rank one, uh, so a secret line in there, if you want. Uh, and so this slope of that line, this uh, scalar A, that's her secret. Yeah, and so uh, she does this. But now this allows Bob to compute phi A of B. So even though he doesn't know phi A, sorry, I, uh, I skipped this, and that's very important. So Alice not only computes this isogeny, Alice also reveals um, the images of uh, the points that will be used by Bob to construct his secret subgroup under her secret isogeny phi A. Yeah. So this is super crucial. Uh, so Alice not only computes her isogeny, but she also computes the images of Bob's auxiliary points under her secret isogeny. And this data is enough for Bob to, uh, to find phi A of B. Why is that? Well, phi A of B, just by homomorphic properties of group homomorphisms, this is just the group generated by phi A of PB. Yeah, so B is this, eh? P, B is PB plus B times QB. Uh, so phi A of B, by these homomorphic properties, is the group generated by phi A of PB, which he received from Alice, plus his secret B times phi A of QB, which he also received from Alice. Yeah? 
And so uh, yeah, that's the fix uh, to the previous problem that Joe and DeFeo proposed in 2011. Uh, and this on a high level is, uh, is what SIDH is, uh, is about. Yeah? And so uh, yeah, here the situation is, of course, uh, the other way around. So Bob reveals the images of Alice's auxiliary points under his secret isogeny phi b. Yeah. So I hope this is clear if, uh, to people that have never seen this before. Um, let me give some technical remarks. As I said, there's more to this than just this high-level uh, scheme. Uh, so just some quick technical remarks, but I won't go into man many details here. Uh, but this will also be important for the attack, namely NA and NB. So NA is the order of these points PA and QA, and so as a consequence, NA is also the order of this group A. Or, in other words, it's also the degree of this isogeny phi A. Well, this has to be smooth. This has to be smooth because Alice wants to compute this isogeny using value type formally, and she wants to do this uh, bit by bit, uh, well, or piece by piece, say. Yeah, so NA has to be smooth, and likewise NB, which is the degree of Bob's secret isogeny phi B, has to be smooth. And then there's whole, this whole super singular thing. Uh, actually, in the whole attack, this super singularity doesn't play a, a big role, so I won't spend many words on this. Uh, these are the only words that I will spend on, on super singular. Why is this game being played with super singular elliptic curves? Uh, well, there are two main reasons. Uh, the first reason is the main, was the main motivation for Joao and DeFeo, uh, namely the isogeny finding problem. I said that it's not equally hard for, for all types of elliptic curves, but the hardest case, up to our knowledge, is, uh, is the case of super singular elliptic curves over finite fields. Yeah, so that's, um, that's with the current state of the art, that's, uh, that's the, those are the hardest isogeny finding problems. Uh, and as a consequence, most uh, isogeny-based cryptographic proposals use super singular elliptic curves, uh, for instance, ski sign. Uh, but another very important reason is that uh, you can fully control the group of rational points. There are explicit formulas for the, like, uh, you can take your elliptic curve, your super singular starting elliptic curve over fp squared. You can choose it to have p plus one squared points. You even understand the group structure. And this gives you full control over uh, the torsion and over, uh, in particular, over where the torsion lives. Yeah, and so it, it allows you to keep working over fp squared if you choose uh, parameters correctly. So this is just very important for efficiency. Uh, but for the attack, it's not super crucial. And so uh, I won't uh, say anything more about super singular. OK. So, just very important, I already implicitly at least uh, said this, but uh, breaking SIDH, and this was clear from the very beginning, breaking SIDH does not amount to solving a pure isogeny finding problem. And there is this auxiliary data, eh? so breaking SIDH, for instance, it suffices to recover Alice's secret isogeny, but you're not, you're not only given uh, the domain and the codomain, you're also given how this isogeny acts on, uh, on, on PB and QB. Yeah, and so this is uh, auxiliary information. So this is became, came to be known as torsion point information. Uh, and this is maybe less important, but we also know the degree of phi A that we're looking for. <coughs> and we know that it is smooth. Okay. Uh, and I want to stress that this is a recurring uh, issue in cryptographic design. So it's very easy, typically, to state a hard computational problem. But building a cryptographic scheme such, in such a way that an attacker has no other options than solving a general instance of that problem uh, that's typically very hard. Uh, and just for instance, to go back to RSA, eh? so we all say RSA is based on the hardness of factoring, but actually there's not really a proof of that. Yeah. So it might be that there's an attack on RSA that doesn't require factoring. And so, uh, yeah, so the same issue is kind of here. Eh? For a long time we thought we have to solve the pure isogeny finding problem to break this scheme. Uh, but, uh, but it's actually a weaker problem that we have to solve. Um, and actually, it was already known, uh, so uh, this started with work by Petit, and this is uh, work with many authors. I know that Chloe is one of them, but, uh, and Petit also, I think, is, is in the plus, uh, on um, showing that if you have torsion point information, and if this torsion point information is very skewed, by which uh, I mean that uh, NB, so this is the order of these points here, is much, much larger than NA. And in the concrete setup of SIDH, this is not the case. But if it's much, much larger than NA, then it was already shown that you, that you can find phi A. So it was already shown that this uh, is really not, uh, not equivalent to a pure isogeny finding problem in terms of hardness. Uh, and let me stress once more that the pure isogeny finding problem uh, remains hard uh, uh, to date. 
Okay, so for the rest of this talk, I will just focus on the following uh, abstract problem, and I hope uh, to have convinced you that solving this problem breaks uh, uh, SIDH. So we are given uh, an elliptic curve and its codomain under a secret isogeny, uh, and we are given how this isogeny acts on a, on a, on a basis. Uh, we assume that these points P and Q are defined ideally spoken over FQ itself. We can tolerate a small uh, degree extension if we want, but let's say P and Q are defined over FQ. And we know that uh, the order of these points, so, the, yeah, so they should be a basis of the n-torsion and n should be large enough. I will be, uh, come back to what we mean by large enough here. Uh, and the, the goal is to find a, a representation of phi. Okay, so this is the problem that we will uh, study. This is not a pure isogeny finding problem. It's an isogeny finding problem with torsion point information. Now let's think a little bit about what we mean by large enough. So there's this kind of folklore statement. It can be found formally in a, a, note, in a paper by Zhao and Urbanic. Um, namely, that if you, and I will get back to this on one of the later slides. If you uh, have an isogeny of degree D, and you know how it acts on 4D plus one points, then that isogeny is uniquely determined, like information theoretically. There cannot be two isogenies uh, of degree D between E and E prime that have the same action on uh, any 4D plus one points. Yeah. So that's easy to prove. It follows from a, a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality uh, on the degree function. Uh, but as I said, I will get back to that later. But now you see here, we are given the action of the isogeny on n squared points, right? because the n-torsion consists of n-squared points. So, um, so what we want is that n-squared, uh, so, so the ideal scenario is that large enough n means that n-squared is bigger than 4d plus 1, or is at least 4d plus 1. Yeah? Or equivalently, n should be strictly bigger than 2 times the square root of e. This would be the optimal assumption in view of this uh, lemma. And this is sharp. Uh, how can you see it's sharp? For instance, uh, take e equal to e prime. Uh, look at the identity and look at the minus one map. They have the same action on the two torsion. And there are four two torsion points. So you need at least five points uh, to distinguish them. Okay, so um, as said, uh, we will follow the approach uh, of Robert. The inspiration for all these works is a, is a paper by Kani. I will not really uh, go into the details uh, of this. Um, so. And let's discuss a first special case. Uh, and it will appear to you as a very special case, and that's correct, but it contains all the main uh, ideas. Uh, so the general case is on a, uh, uh, a relatively simple generalization of this. Um, so the first special case is we assume, we are going to assume that n is bigger than d. So as I said on the previous slide, ideally we want to assume that n is bigger than square root of d roughly. Uh, but let's assume now that n is bigger than d. So remind, a reminder, d is the degree of phi, and n is the order of these points p and q. And the big assumption that we are going to make here, which is almost never satisfied, but let's assume it is, is that n minus d is a perfect square, okay, equals uh, a squared for some uh, integer a. Well, then one can consider the following uh, isogeny between abelian surfaces. And in fact, uh, uh, yeah, it's important to consider these abelian surfaces together with the natural principle polarization, the product polarization. But I won't say much about that. Uh, how should we read this? Well, we should read this as uh, the isogeny that sends the point PQ to the couple AP plus phi hat Q. And then the second uh, entry is minus phi um, uh, P, um, wait, is this correct actually? Maybe this should be E prime plus E. Uh, is this? No. Oh, no, 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 it's okay, yeah. And then the second entry is minus phi of P plus A times Q. Yeah, this is uh, the map we are going to consider. Um, and here's a check. Uh, I won't go through the details of this computation, but it's easy to check that if you compose this isogeny, with its dual, then you get multiplication uh, by n, where n is the order of p and q. Yeah. So that's an explicit computation. Uh, and if you do the computation, uh, it's important that you see that this kind of pops out on the diagonal. Yeah. And this, what is this? This is this a squared plus d. So that's why this is n that pops out on the diagonal. Is this kind of clear? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. And uh, it's also important that this is an isogeny really of principally polarized abelian uh, surfaces. So uh, this isogeny 
starting from the principal polarization here, induces the principal polarization here, and it's exactly the product polarization. Okay. So uh, such an isogeny, we call it in this context an N, N isogeny. And the magic thing is that we can write down its kernel. So we don't know this isogeny. Yeah? You look at all these red entries, so we don't know the isogeny at all. Uh, but we can write down its kernel. And why can we write down its kernel? Well, this is thanks to distortion point information, and the computation is here, so it's very short. Um, so I claim that the point A times P, comma P prime is in the kernel. Okay, so let's uh, evaluate this matrix on A times P, comma P prime, but P prime, remember this is phi of P. Yeah. So if I do this computation, I find A squared P plus phi hat of phi P, phi hat phi is the degree, so this is D, so I find A squared plus D times P. This is N, but my point P is of order N, so I land at the point at infinity. Yeah, and this here is minus phi a, a phi, so this cancels each other and we land at the point at infinity. So this is a point that sits in the kernel of this uh, secret isogeny. And likewise, of course, for a q, q prime. There's nothing special about p. Yeah. And if you then have a look, we know that the kernel is, a, is an n, n subgroup. And we have found an n, n subgroup that sits in the kernel. So it has to be uh, the entire kernel. And so this is really uh, uh, the, the magic. We can use distortion point information uh, to write down the kernel of this map that we don't know. But if you know the kernel of an isogeny, so now I'm, yeah, I, I, I stated this for elliptic curves, but it's also true in higher dimension. If you have this kernel, then you can compute the isogeny using value type formula. So we just uh, compute the isogeny going from here uh, quotienting out this subgroup, and basically we are computing this isogeny. And so you see that the maps phi and phi hat, they appear as components, and so they reveal themselves. Yeah? So this really determines uh, phi. So while at first this is a very secret isogeny, this isogeny between E cross E prime and itself, yeah, it turns out that there's nothing secret about it, uh, thanks to this uh, torsion point information. Yeah. There's this uh, issue that uh, a kernel only defines the isogeny up to post-composition with an isomorphism, but that's an issue that is uh, easily dealt with. Um, okay, so conclusion. Using higher dimensional analogs of Velus formula, we can evaluate phi. Uh, how do you do it, for instance? Uh, you apply this capital. If you want to evaluate phi in X, you evaluate, for instance, uh, this uh, capital phi in uh, the point X0 or X infinity. Um, and you will see that uh, minus phi of x appears as a component, yes? Just to be clear, a here is not Alice in space. Sorry? The a in this phi is not Alice in space. No, no, no. Uh, yes, sorry, that's bad. Uh, that's an unfortunate choice of notation. Can you repeat the question, please? Ah, yeah, so the question uh, by Drew was whether this a, or, well, his, <laughs> guess, his uh, suggestion was that I should uh, emphasize that this a is not Alice's a. Yeah, it's just... Uh, yeah, it's just uh, the integer such that n minus d is a squared, yeah. Okay, but the takeaway message is uh, we can hide this, we can embed this phi in a, in a higher dimensional isogeny of which we know the kernel, and thanks to these value type uh, algorithms, we know then the isogeny, and so this reveals phi. Yeah. And so this is exactly, I, a couple of slides ago, I mentioned that we have a new way of efficiently representing an isogeny. Well, this is exactly it. So this is, this kind of, uh, this description is really an efficient uh, representation of an isogeny. So just to break um, SIDH concretely, uh, so if you want to find the kernel of uh, phi, you evaluate this on a, on a basis of the detorsion. And then with some linear algebra, um, modulo d, uh, you will find the kernel of phi. Yeah. But for this you need uh, d to be smooth, but that's true in SIDH. Okay. So that's the special case. So this seems to be a very strong assumption, and it is a strong assumption. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, so this is the main insight that Tamiya had, so I think uh, it's, uh, you can relax it uh, very easily. Uh, but let's, oh yeah, so uh, sorry, I thought uh, I, was, I had a different slide in mind, but let's, okay, let's first have a look at this. Um, um, to run this in practice, uh, there's one particular, case that is extremely nice, and that's where the order of the points P and Q is a power of 2. 
Yeah? If the order of uh, this n is a power of 2, then our n n subgroup that we want to quotient out, yeah? this is a, a 2 to the n, comma 2 to the n subgroup. So it splits as a composition of two 2-isogenies. Two and for two 2-isogenies, two there are very efficient formulas. Yeah? And it's maybe interesting to see what this looks like. Uh, so this is our overall uh, isogeny phi that we want to evaluate. We split it into two two isogenies. It's interesting to remark that along the way you will not hit products of elliptic curves. You will pass uh, across Jacobians. Yeah. Uh, so and uh, two two isogenies between Jacobians. Uh, yeah. And so okay, uh, let's skip this. But this is just how you then uh, determine the kernel of the next one, the kernel of the next one, and so on. It's not too important. Uh, but these uh, two two isogenies between Jacobians, they are super efficient, thanks to a uh, formula due to Richelieu. They are already, and, and this I always find amazing, they are from the 19th century. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, for these steps, this is uh, very classical, very easy, very efficient. Uh, and for these outer steps, to go from a product of elliptic curves to, uh, to, uh, to the Jacobian of a genus 2 curve, and the other way around, you can uh, apply gluing formula that can be found in a paper by uh, how uh, Le Prevost and Poonen uh, from uh, 2000. Uh, what is also fairly explicit, this was recently done by Thomas de Cru and Sabrina Kunzweiler, is uh, you have fairly explicit formulas for 3 3 isogenies also. Uh, in a, they can be found in a paper by Brian Testa from, Testa from 14. But if you have to go away from 2 2 or 3 3 isogenies, uh, you have to resort to these more general algorithms that, uh, to be honest, I don't understand very well. And they, uh, they have not really been implemented as far as I uh, know, or at least not to the extent that we can just use them as a plugin for attacking uh, SIDH. Uh, but uh, they should also be efficient once they are implemented. And the authors here are uh, Lubitsch and uh, Robert. Uh, yeah, and this is from 22, but it builds on, on uh, much, uh, much older work. Okay, now let's go to the next case. The next case is where this difference is not a perfect square, but the sum of two squares. And that's already a less restrictive assumption. It's still restrictive, but at least sums of two squares are not that uncommon. Uh, well, the approach is just the same. But instead of in the upper left uh, entry, you write an A, you write a two by two matrix. And the only thing that you have to remember about that two by two matrix is it's, it's such that if you multiply it with its transpose, you have scalar multiplication by A1 squared plus A2 squared. That's the only uh, property that we want. Yeah? And that's easy to check. Yeah? And then everything else is the same. But you have to move up uh, from dimension 2 to dimension 4. So 2 2 isogenies, 3 3 isogenies, they are out of the picture here. You really have to resort to, this, uh, to these more general formulas. But that's, that's it. Yeah? Um, and then, uh, yeah, for the general case, uh, so this is sometimes referred to as Zarin's trick. I, to be honest, I think, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what Zarin's trick is exactly, uh, but maybe it's a general thing to move up dimensions uh, by a factor four. Um, so uh, if you write it as a sum of four squares, which we're gonna always do, and uh, it's easy to do this efficiently also, uh, you can uh, use this matrix here. And this matrix is again, uh, this again has a property that if you multiply it with its transpose, you uh, end up with a, a scalar matrix that is multiplication by this. So this is matrix of multiplication in the quaternions, uh, if you want to, uh, to understand where this comes from. Matrix of multiplication on the left by the quaternion A1 plus A2i plus A3j plus A4k. Uh, yeah, and that's it. But clearly here we also cannot use uh, Richelieu or, or the 3 3 isogenies. Um, still, this is not a fully general case because we are still assuming that n is bigger than d. And ideally spoken, we would like to go to n to be about square root of d. Well, this also can be done. Um, and uh, the idea is, well, we just uh, pick points. I, I wrote them as 1 over np. Of course, this is not uniquely determined. But you say, let's pick, let's imagine points. We will never write them down in practice. But let's imagine uh, a point which is such that if I multiply it by n, I end up at p. And let's do the same for q. So let's just imagine those points. We will not need them. But they will automatically form a basis for the n squared torsion. Um, and let's proceed with the previous attacks, depending on uh, whether we have a square, sum of two squares, sum of four squares. Let's proceed with, uh, with these previous attacks. Uh, but now the problem is we, we don't know the kernel of phi. 
Because to know the kernel of phi, we need to know how phi acts on these, uh, these points. I mean, we don't even write down the points themselves, let alone we write down their images. But to remember from this uh, Richelieu chain, we will break up this isogeny in pieces. And uh, thanks to the fact that we know the action on P and Q, we can uh, do the first half. Yeah, so this is what we will do. We can do the first half because we know n times the kernel of phi. Because that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's what we had in the previous version. Uh, but if you look at this matrix, you can also yeah, dualize it and approach the problem from the other side. And so we also know uh, n times the kernel of the dual of phi. So we can close it from two sides. We arrive, you have to normalize things a little bit, but you arrive at the same abelian uh, eightfold in the worst case, x. And then you, uh, you flip this, uh, and so you recover phi as uh, the dual of the dual of uh, phi 2 composed with phi 1. And that's, uh, that's, the, that's the trick. Uh, and so this is, yeah, in some sense, the optimal answer that we wanted uh, to our problem, at least uh, theoretically. So uh, as said, a lot of this has not been implemented if you go away from 2, 2, and 3, 3 isogenies. And so that's what the next slide is about. Uh, so how do you now break SIDH in practice? Suppose you only can use two, two isogenies, say. Um, so, or three, three isogenies. So these are the two uh, instances that have been implemented. So until this has been uh, uh, made practical, let's, uh, let's assume we only have access to these two uh, things in practice. Well, the good news is that in the concrete setups of SIDH, uh, NA is really a power of two, and NB is really uh, a power of three. So depending on whether NA is bigger than NB or whether NB is bigger than NA, we can use two, two or three, three isogenies. So that's, uh, that's the good news. But the bad news is, of course, that this difference is never a square. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not sure if it's never a square, but it would uh, yield record-breaking ABC triples, I think, if you would find a, a square. So it, it would really, it's, it's, yeah, it's totally unimaginable in practice that this is a square. And so we cannot run this attack because we don't know what to put here. And uh, yeah, it seems that we are kind of condemned to move up to dimension four at least. Uh, and then we, uh, we, have no longer, uh, we can no longer use uh, uh, the formulas for 2, 2, or 3, 3 isogenies. Uh, but, and this is actually the first uh, versions of the attack that was written down. Uh, it is possible to avoid going to dimension four by exploiting the fact that the starting curve, E, in a SIDH and psych is special. Uh, so I simplify it a little bit, he little bit here, but uh, for instance, if the starting curve is this one, in fact, it was not this one, but it, it was a neighbor of this one, uh, but if the starting curve is this one, then it comes with, an, uh, with a special automorphism, which is multiplication by mi which acts as multiplication by minus one. Yeah? And so uh, instead of writing in the upper left corner this two by two matrix, A1, A2, minus A2, A1, we can write uh, a1 plus i times a2 here. It complicates things a bit because uh, on the lower right, yeah, so if this were an e prime again, you would also write to, like to write a1 plus i times a2 there to make things compatible, but i does not exist on e prime. i exists on e, but not on e prime. And so you have to, uh, yeah, you have to push through uh, these isogenies. You land on a different curve C, but this is all technical. Uh, but the main takeaway message here is that this upper left corner, which was this scalar A, you can also replace it with an endomorphism or even an isogeny to a different curve uh, if you want. For instance, if you know a smooth degree isogeny to a different curve. Uh, how am I doing time-wise? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so you can put whatever you want here. Uh, and this takes us back to dimension two. And so uh, it's still not super likely, but it's likely enough uh, so that together with some guessing of first steps and so on, you can really break psych in practice. And the current implementations, they really run in seconds on a laptop. And this is for the, um, for the largest security levels that were proposed. Okay, so here I'm referring to uh, an implementation effort initiated by Udom Feng and uh, Pope, but several other people have helped here. Uh, Lorenz Pani is at least one of them. Um, and this is the paper by the crew and Kunzweiler that I mentioned. Okay, now I would like to use the last uh, 10 minutes to, uh, to discuss some follow-up things. Um, and the first thing that I would like to discuss is a, is a countermeasure that was proposed uh, um, initially by uh, Fuotza. It appeared in a paper by uh, Fuotza, Moria, and Petit. Uh, and the observation is 
uh, yeah, standard, and I guess it was known uh, before. Namely, for this trick to work, you don't really need to know phi A of PB and phi A of QB. It suffices that you know these images up to some joint scalar, and that scalar can be a secret. Yeah, so instead of revealing phi A of PB and phi A of QB, uh, Alice could just reveal lambda times phi A of PB, lambda times phi A of QB for some secret lambda. Yeah. And uh, Bob can still play this game. Yeah. So the secret lambda here comes out. It's, well, as long as, as it's a unit modulo the order of, of PB, of course. But uh, this, so the secret lambda doesn't, uh, doesn't mess up with this. And so Bob can still compute phi A of B. But now, if Alice reveals lambda of phi A of PB, lambda phi A of QB, she doesn't reveal the torsion points anymore, and these were really crucial in the attack. Yeah? So, uh, this leads to the following variant of uh, the previous problem. Uh, so again, we have our two uh, isogenies connected by a secret isogeny, uh, sorry, we have our two elliptic curves connected by a secret isogeny phi. Uh, we know how uh, this isogeny, uh, sorry, we are given uh, a basis of the n-torsion, and we don't know exactly how uh, phi acts on that uh, basis, but we know up to a common scalar. Yeah, so that's a variant of this problem, and now I will assume that n is bigger than d, uh, because that uh, will turn out to be the natural assumption, instead of n bigger than square root of d. Uh, I don't know information theoretically what, what, what would be the optimal thing here. But, um, uh, okay, and then the goal is again to uh, find a representation of phi. Now there's one immediate thing you can do, and this uh, immediately also makes this, like from a cryptographic point of view, uh, much less interesting, but still it's interesting from a theoretical point of view. But the immediate thing you can do is you can compute the well pairing of P and Q. You can compute the well pairing of P prime and Q prime. Yeah, and if you do this calculation, you will see that this uh, lambda squared comes out. Sorry, there's a D missing here. Uh, so the thing that comes out is lambda squared times the degree of phi. So it's lambda squared times D. But D is known. Yeah. So in any case, you learn uh, lambda squared from this. Yeah. And so, for instance, if the order of P and Q is a power of a, a big prime, you basically learn lambda from this as the square root of lambda uh, squared. But there is a situation where it's still hard to extract lambda from lambda squared, and that's where N has many distinct prime factors. Yeah. And so this was the proposal. Uh, use an n that is uh, smooth, but a product of many distinct prime factors, and then lambda squared will have an exponential amount of square roots, and so knowing lambda squared is not enough to know lambda. Okay. So that's the proposal by Fuotsa, uh, Mori, and Petit. Um, so um, it's less interesting from a cryptographic point of view because by moving from powers of two to products of many distinct prime factors, you make the scheme much, much less efficient. Yeah? So for the moment, it's like a theoretical thing. It's not fully broken, um, but there are some weaknesses. Uh, and so already in their paper where they proposed it, they uh, revealed such a weakness. Um, namely, what can you do? So this is our diagram that we have. And imagine now that E has a small non-scalar endomorphism. So I will draw this here. And so this is uh, yeah, what comes to be known more and more as a lollipop in isogeny-based crypto. Um, so what you can do is you first apply phi hat. We don't know phi and phi hat, but so it's a red thing here. Then we apply sigma, and then we apply phi. And we look at this uh, composition, okay? And um, I think I will, this is a bit technical, uh, so I think I will just say the main uh, message here. The thing is that um, by going here and here, these lambdas, they kind of uh, cancel each other. Yeah, that follows from this computation. Please, please ignore the computation itself. Uh, maybe the slides will be available online at some point, yeah, and then you can have a look if you want. Uh, but the main message is that these lambdas cancel each other, and so we really know the images of P prime and Q prime under this composition. We know them exactly. Now, uh, if the order of these points, uh, P prime and Q prime, is bigger than the square root of this thing. We can run the previous attack. Uh, but what is the square root of this thing? So the degree of phi hat composed with sigma composed with phi is, well, this has degree d, this has degree d, this has degree degree of sigma. So there's a d squared, and thanks to the square root, it com only comes out as a d. But in practice, in SIDH type schemes, you will have that n is bigger than d. Uh, so, uh, 
So this is not far from it, and it's very likely if uh, sigma has a very small degree that you will actually have that n is bigger than d times square root of the degree of sigma, and if you don't have it, you can guess a few steps and then uh, make, uh, work yourself into that setting. Okay, and so the bottom, oh, the conclusion is that if um, E has a small uh, uh, degree endomorphism, then uh, M side is, is weak, yeah, M break it. So you have to move to a starting curve which does not carry a, start, uh, a small degree endomorphism. So that's already a bit annoying. Uh, what was unnoticed in, uh, yeah, you can only recover five from this if this is cyclic. Uh, yeah, and, uh, it could collapse maybe to a scalar multiplication or something, but uh, in practice it won't. Uh, there's a small thing that was not uh, noticed in this uh, paper, and that's if your starting curve is defined over FP, uh, you can uh, tweak this idea and also break M site. Uh, so even though it may be the case that E does not come with a small degree endomorphism. And so what you do here, you use the Frobenius here, but instead of yeah, going back and forth, like lollipop wise, you, I don't know if this is a shape uh, from the candy industry, but uh, yeah, you can uh, make this diagram. So uh, you can complete it uh, by uh, pushing, uh, yeah, by, 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 by using Frobenius here. So this phi p is such that if you compose Frobenius with phi, it's the same as composing phi p with, with Frobenius. Um, and then using these ingredients, uh, I will again skip the computation. You can again, uh, you again will observe that these lambdas cancel. So you can again throw from here to here uh, by basically uh, first applying the dual of phi and then applying this uh, Frobenius uh, twist of phi. And you will again uh, uh, yeah, have this cancellation and you will see the images of P prime and Q prime under this isogeny. And so uh, the degree of this is obviously d squared. And so if n is bigger than d, uh, this will reveal uh, phi. Okay, so for the moment M side in general is unbroken, but it's broken if you have a small, so, but yeah, it's not really practical. It's a nice theoretical problem. It's not really practical for crypto applications. It's broken if you have a small degree endomorphism on the starting curve or on the codomain curve is also fine. Uh, or if the starting curve uh, or the codomain curve is defined over FP and it's also broken. Yeah, but in general, uh, it's not broken. Um, so when I have to stop at two more, two more minutes, okay. Um, I'll quickly go over uh, this slide. Uh, but as I said, the main byproduct uh, is that we can now consider uh, giving the action of uh, phi on a torsion basis. We can view this as an efficient representation of an isogeny. Yeah, and this has uh, applications. Uh, so there was a speed up of ski sign, ski sign that I already mentioned, uh, and this really uses representing isogenies in this way. Uh, the next talk will be by Luciano uh, uh, on Festa, which also uses this idea. Um, there's also oriented elliptic curves that were designed by uh, David Cole and uh, Leonardo Colo, uh, and now you can also use this representation to efficiently handle the orientation on elliptic curves. So. Um, so yeah, and maybe there's more, more things in that list. Uh, and then Damien Robert has a paper, which is really exciting uh, on uh, applications, other applications. So let me just state the applications. Um, so um, thanks to this, uh, we can now, so all of this is yeah, due to Robert. Uh, thanks to this, we can now compute endomorph. And there's more, there, there's more ideas to this than just, it's not straightforward application. I want to stress that. But thanks to this, we can now compute endomorphism rings of ordinary elliptic curves in polynomial time, given that we know the factorization of the discriminant. But that's the only remaining bottleneck. Uh, we also have a p-adic point counting algorithm now that runs in polynomial time in log p uh, for elliptic curves. Uh, and uh, there's also an uh, OL cubed, O tilde L cubed algorithm for computing uh, the classical modular polynomial phi L. Uh, this was already known. Uh, under GRH, but now this is unconditional. Yeah, so this, uh, these are three uh, nice results. And then, uh, yeah, my last minute maybe, uh, I would like to make publicity uh, for variants of this problem. Uh, because remember this lemma. So a degree D isogeny is determined by the images on any 4D plus one points. And for now, we always, uh, so in, in this whole talk, uh, these, this point set on which we fix the image, of which we fix the images, 
was the full end torsion. But you could also imagine uh, fixing uh, the image of a cyclic group of large enough order. Can we do something there? Uh, and so in general, I will uh, skip to the slide. I don't have time to discuss this. Uh, but the answer is that in general, this is open. Unless this, so, so uh, yeah, maybe I should have shown this at least. Uh, <laughs> so the problem is, now we are given the image of a single point instead of on the full torsion. But the single point has order n at least 4d plus 1 then at least information theoretically the isogeny should be fixed by this. And the question is, can we now find the isogeny in an efficient way? Uh, and the answer is yes, if, uh, if this uh, order is a, is a square, or if it's divisible by a large enough square. Uh, but for instance, for uh, a prime number n, we don't know. Yeah, and I, I really like this problem, um, but we have no, no ideas uh, how to solve it. And so uh, I think I, uh, yeah, I have to stop here, so thank you. No, as far as I uh, you can tell, no. Yeah. Ah. ah, yeah, sorry, I was, I was somehow waiting for the microphone and I have it, yeah. Um, so, uh, that's a good question, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know uh, the answer to this. Uh, so, the attacks really, well, maybe the question is about these concrete attacks. So, if n is not bigger than square root of d, you, can, you can't do anything, basically. Yeah, so you can't do like a partial thing. Uh, but maybe there are other algorithms that, that can. Uh, yeah. And I'm also a little bit intrigued by this bound. So the 4D plus 1 is sharp because there are examples. But um, yeah, somehow this is the only example, example reaching that bound that I can come up with. So I think generically it's, uh, yeah, you can do with fewer points somehow. So, and then maybe you can ask sharper questions of, of the type that we study. I have, I, have an, <coughs> I have an answer to David's question. Okay. In super singular curves, we can trust. We, we prove these kind of questions. Like, it, yeah, there is a point when uh, the information given by oh, the yeah, function yeah. point is useless. Yeah. And you can very precisely, just by looking at Ramanujan graphs, tell when this information is useless. Any other questions? Um. I had one that um, I <laughs> thought of while you were giving these various uh, sort of applications of the Frobenius and the dual isogeny attack that were in these earlier papers that are now way more powerful. I did wonder if you or anyone had thought about um, in avoiding these small endomorphisms if you somehow get close to the backdoor curves from that earlier paper or if the backdoor curves can still be backdoor curves when it's masked. Um, maybe not, I don't know. Kate's here as well, she, she did this originally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe I'm not, so not well enough, not, not familiar enough. Not that you know of, not yeah, that you know yeah. of. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? If not, let's thank Wouter again. Thank you.